Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. We're in Genesis chapter 8 in our Bibles. The title of the message today is Waiting on the Lord. Yes, yes, waiting on the Lord. We've all been there, huh? Working through a series I've titled Genesis in the Beginning God. We're working through the book of Genesis, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We'll cover 50 chapters before we're done in this book. And it's been a wonderful journey. God has been in the beginning. He is in the end, and this whole book is about him. I know there's a lot of stories about people in this book, but it's ultimately about him and what he's doing in human beings' lives. What he's doing in our lives. He is the hero. He is Superman showing up. He is Batman saving the day. He is the one swooping in to save the day over and over and over in every single one of these stories. His plan is being carried out. So when we look at the Bible, we look through the lens of God's eyes. We put on the God glasses and we look through his eyes as we read through the scriptures. And today we will watch God once again, bless Noah and his family in an amazing way. Tell the message again, waiting on the Lord. Did you hear about that story? You know. About that teacher who was helping one of her kindergarten students put his boots on. This teacher trying to get the boots on this little boy. He asked her for help and she could see why with her pulling and pushing and the boots still didn't want to go on. By the time she got the second boot on, she had worked up a sweat, you know, trying to get this thing on the boy's feet. She almost lost it when the little boy said, Teacher, they're on the wrong feet. She looked, and sure enough, there they were. It wasn't an easy thing pulling the boots off than it was putting them on. She managed to keep her cool as they worked together to get the boots back on, and this time on the right feet. Then he announced, These aren't my boots. She bit her tongue rather than get right in his face and scream, why didn't you say so? Uh, once, once again, she struggled to help him, you know, take him off and put it back on. He then said, teacher, these are my brother's boots. My mom made me wear them. She said, didn't you know that? I mean, why, why wouldn't you tell me? Finally finding his boots, she mustered up the grace to wrestle them off his feet again, only to put them back on. And she looked at him and said, now where are your mittens? And he said, I stuffed them in my boots. Now, thank you, as super. Today we will see patience, trust, and faith from Noah. Have you ever heard that saying, what you are going through today is preparing you for what you will go through tomorrow? What you are working through right now is actually preparation for tomorrow in the coming months. We're about to see Noah go on a very long cruise, very long cruise. And I know when we read over this story, we think like, no, he was just on 40 days, 40 nights. Oh no. <laughs> he was on the boat over a year, 375 days to be exact. And that's a long time. He had to wait a very long time on the Lord to remove the waters that flooded the earth. He was waiting on God, waiting, looking out the window over and over, and notice, as we will see in the text, God never gave him a time when the waters would go down. He didn't say, hey, Noah, this is your date. This is your time that the waters are going to be gone. He just said, hey, get on the boat. I'm going to flood the earth, and then we'll see what happens. You're like, Lord, are we ever getting off this boat? Do you remember that cruise ship back in, I think it was 2014, it was a Carnival Triumph cruise, broke down for five days, the septic, sewage, all that stuff was backed up, people were in line for like five hours for food, complaining, there were a total of like 30 something people who tried to sue Carnival for $5,000 per month for the rest of their life, because they were stuck on the boat for five days. <laughs> Now, I get it. When you're in the situation, you're like, I'm going to kill somebody, right? It's like, dude, get out of my way. I just want a piece of chicken, you know? It's like, I need to use the restroom. I'm not standing in line any longer. Because you went on a cruise to find 
an amazing time and you're stuck on that boat and nothing's going on. The motor had blown. Well, anyways, they didn't win that case. I hope you know if you, if you want to look that up. But have you ever had to wait for something? Yeah, me too. Waiting for Christmas as a child was hard, huh? Remember? Sitting in your bed, waiting, like you almost can't sleep the night before because you can't wait to get up. And it's like the only day you wake up super early. You're like, it's like 2 a.m. You're like, Dad, is it okay? He's like, go back to bed, you know? Because you want to open those gifts. Or you remember waiting to get out of school? It took so long. Remember waiting to get your driver's license? You remember waiting to get contacted saying you got the job? Remember waiting to find that perfect mate? Remember waiting for a door to open or a door to close in your life? Waiting through hardship, sickness, or loss? Katie and I were waiting for a baby. Six years we waited. We all have things we are waiting for to move forward in, and it's not easy. And today we will see Noah wait a long time in a boat for the waters to go down so we can get off that boat and start life. What he didn't know is God was bringing life to him in his waiting. God was doing something in the waiting. He was creating something. You remember what happened last week? God flooded the earth. God told Noah to get on the ark, and Noah obeyed everything the Lord commanded him from the beginning. He believed that God was going to bring a flood. He pursued building an ark that took over 100 years to build. Talk about a construction project. And the day came when it began to rain, and it flooded, and they are on the ark, and that is where our story picks up. Genesis chapter 8, let's read verses 1 through 12. What do you say? Let's stand for the reading of God's word. We stand for the reading of God's word, always to pay honor to him. It's his words we're looking at, not mine. God's word before us. Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 8, it says, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the top of the mountains were seen. At the end of the forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground, but the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he set forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he, what? Waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and did, she did not return to him anymore. Let's pray. What a process. Father, you, you put Noah and his family in an ark with all the animals, and to save them from the flood, you cleansing the earth of all wickedness and evil. Lord, he didn't know when he was going to be able to get off that boat. And you just told him to keep waiting. And Lord, it's hard to wait. We're all waiting for something. We're all looking forward to something. We want something to change. We hope something happens. We hope a door opens or a door closes. But we want to declare to you today that we trust your plan. We trust your will. We know that you are working. And we pray, Lord, through this text that you would open our eyes once again to see what it looks like to wait on the Lord, that you would bless us. Holy Spirit, minister to us now, we pray, as we look at your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Picture this with me. Noah has just spent 100 plus years building this ark. The Lord had told him to get on the ark. Seven days before the rain 
and the flood were going to come, and he got all the animals on, and God commanded him to get on that ark with his family, and then God closed the door of the ark by himself. Remember? Amazing. It's like, uh, who's going to close the door, uh, Papa Noah? He's like, no, no one's going to do it. I'm not going to do it. God is going to do it for us. And God closes the door and it begins to rain. The rain started to pour and the ground blew open and the earth began to flood, killing everything on dry land. Water poured on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And I bet Noah wondered when it was going to stop raining. Okay, there's rain, and it, wow, it's really coming down. Okay, that's a real flood. Wow, we're being tossed to and fro in this boat. Is this thing ever going to stop? We can barely handle two days of rain here in L.A., huh? You step out of your car into the gutter, and bam, like your whole foot's wet, right? It's all soaked. You weren't prepared. You thought you were going to jump over that puddle, right, and you dive right into the center of it? <laughs> You're walking down the street and that dude, you know, sprays you with his car, you know. And everyone in L.A. doesn't know how to drive when it starts raining. Everybody just either drives super slow or they get really crazy. You notice that? It's like all the turtles come out, you know, everybody's like, do 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 okay, blinker, you know, do do okay, don't go, you know. And that whole thing happens. Or people are just maniacs on the freeway. When is it going to stop? But one day it did. That rain stopped with Noah. And Moses tells us that it took 150 days before the waters began to recede. Now, can you imagine being in this situation, sitting in that giant wooden box floating on the water, thousands of animals with you? How long would it take before you start to go nuts? All those animals and you're stuck with your family members? You're like, I can only handle four hours at Christmas and then I'm out. Yeah, you're on this boat with them for days, a long time. Your kids are asking, are we there yet, right? The apes monkeying around, of course. But Noah waited patiently in the ark. It's kind of like being on a road trip for 40 days and not being able to leave the car, not being able to open a window. Can you imagine 149 days or five months in the ark and the water not moving? You're like looking out, trying to calculate the horizon. Like, I think it moved an inch. It's like, no, it hasn't moved an inch. It's the same as it always has been. It's been 149 days, and the water has not receded. I don't see anything anywhere. I wonder if Noah began to wonder, man, is the water ever going to go away? The great man of faith, Noah, who spent a hundred years of his life building an ark, but once he gets on that thing and he's out there on the waters, he knows they only have a certain amount of food. He knows those animals can only survive a certain amount. Of, think about the burdens that he's carrying, the worry, the stress, the things that are going through his mind, managing all this thing. He starts to wonder, yeah, it's been like a hundred days and like the waters haven't moved. I thought it was only 40 days, 40 nights. Lord, what's the day count? When is this thing going away? And what does the Lord say to him? Nothing. Nothing. Silence. God does not speak. Noah begins to wonder how this is all going to work out. Is God going to pull through on this one? This was real life for him. Five months on the water is a long time. You ever even done an overnight trip, deep sea fishing? We did like two and a half, three days. It's a long time going to Mexico waters, deep sea fishing, super fun. But man, it's a long time being on that boat. And it never stops rocking. So when you get back on dry land, you can literally feel yourself still rocking. Imagine being on there for 150 days. Longest cruise for sure for Noah. He was over cruises. I want you to watch this journey Noah is about to go through on the ark. Many think the story goes just 40 days, 40 nights, but man, this guy stays on the boat. He will sit on that boat for 375 days, over one year, because even once the water started to recede, as you see in the progression of the text, he sends out birds to see if there's dry land. He still has to sit on there months and months and months. 
Never heard this part in my Sunday school class, but they were on it for over a year, and that's a long time. Take a look at verse 1. It says, but God remembered Noah. Praise God. And all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth. There it is. God making the wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. So after 150 days, God remembered Noah. Did he forget Noah? No, no, he doesn't forget. Does God forget anything ever? No. God doesn't forget about anything. When the Bible says the phrase, God remembered, it is implying and saying that God is about to do something for that person. Or God is about to act in that person's life. You're like, Lord, remember me. Remember me every day. Work in me. Do something in me. Listen, I know it may feel like 150 days of waiting in your life at times. Maybe after a great flood has happened. And you wonder if God is thinking about you. You wonder if God is going to remember you. Know this. God has a plan and he has not forgotten you. Even if it feels like your whole world is flooded, God has not forgotten you. You need to know that. You need to grab onto that promise. And here is the promise. Are you ready? Isaiah chapter 49 Verse 14, listen. Isaiah 49, verse 14. The Lord, but Zion says, his people say, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but God says, I will never forget you. Verse 16, behold. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your life is continually before me. He says, if it is even possible that a nursing mother can forget her child, I will never forget you. And this is how I'll prove it to you. Behold, I have engraved your name on my hands. I remember you daily. God's thoughts towards you are more than the sand on the seashore. I love going to the beach and grabbing a handful of sand and just looking. You have more thoughts than this for me? Why? What, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is so special about us? God says, I remember you, and I have not forgotten you. Psalm 27.10, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Even if my mom and dad don't want me, the Lord in heaven wants me and is for me and will never let me go. What a gracious father. Noah sat there for 150 days wondering when something would happen. It was quiet. He had not heard the voice of the Lord since he got on that ark. And God gave him no confirmation at this point. God says nothing to Noah. He just starts moving. He just starts doing this is a good lesson for us. Point number one, if you're taking notes, even when it's quiet, God is working. Even when it's quiet, God is still working. But I haven't heard the voice of the Lord. I don't feel God like I used to. He's still working. He's still powerfully moving in your life. He knows what he's doing. Have you ever been in a season where you don't feel God at all? I have. I call them winter times, when everything's really cold and dark. Sun goes down early. And I'm waiting for summer, man. I want spring. I want some flowers. I want to smell, you know, the, the good stuff in the springtime. And I want to have a blast during summer. But sometimes God allows us to go through quiet periods in life, and that is not a bad thing. Why? Because he's doing something. He is building something in us, in the silence. What did God promise Noah? Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. He promised him that everything on the earth will perish, but verse 18, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. God told Noah that he would flood the earth, but that he would save his family. God has promised us, Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation. Did you know that? Jesus, the King, the Messiah, the Lord, he has promised us tribulation. He says, disciples, boys, listen, in this life you will have trouble. But what did he say next? 
take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome it all. You're going to have trouble. It's going to rain on you. Life's already hard enough, man. We got sin all, the, all over the earth, people hating and hurting each other, sickness and disease, problems, right? You go bald and stuff and, you know. And then we got the enemy coming after us, trying to mess up life. And then the fact of the matter is it just rains on everybody. Stuff just goes wrong because the earth is broken. Nothing is ever easy. When something goes right and it's super easy, you're like, man, you got to praise God for that. Like, are you serious? That was so easy. Thank you, Lord. But generally, that's not how it is. God has promised you that he will save you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That is the promise that I need. I need to know that God's going to keep talking to me, ministering to me, convicting me, speaking into my life for the rest of my life. The Holy Spirit is not going to leave me, abandon me. I need to know that when I wake up in the morning and I feel like running away from things, he's going to call to me. Son, what are you doing? Get over here. Don't get far away from your father. It's dangerous. You're going to destroy your life. That's all I need is that God will be with me for the rest of my life and keep me till the very end. That is enough. Because even when I fail, he'll be right there to pick me up, encourage me, and move me forward. That's what I need. I need a Savior. Notice, God did not put a time limit on his promise to Noah. He didn't. Noah, do you know what I'm saying? Listen closely. I am going to put your family on the ark, and I'm going to flood the earth, and I will save you. Well, Lord, what's the timeline stuff? Sorry, bud. No timeline for you. One year, literally, right? Soup Nazi, right? No timeline for you. One year, 375 days. One year, 10 days later. God's timing is always perfect. Watch this. You know what that means? He's never early. He's never late. He's always right on time. Lord, please, early. I like early. Me too. But Lord, please don't be late. Please, I, please. I, don't worry. He's always going to be right on time. Listen to this. Don't mistake God's silence for being finished. Don't mistake God's silence for being finished in your life. He's not done. He's still working. God will finish what he has started and what he has promised. He always keeps his promises. Psalm chapter 89 verse 34, I will not violate my covenant, says the Lord, or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Though there's a lot of people that don't keep their promises to you, though there are a lot of people who will fail you and not show up at the time they say they were going to, though there are people that say they're going to do this for you and then never do it, God doesn't do that. When he says he's going to do something, he will keep his promise and he cannot fail. He's perfect to the very end. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Did you hear that? He is so faithful that he will keep his covenant to a thousand generations. You're like, dude, I hope I can keep my covenant for one generation. Just my lifetime, Lord. Can you just help me to stay married? He just helped me to be faithful to my job. He just helped me to love my kids well. He just helped me to love and serve my neighborhood. I just want to be faithful to you one lifetime, one generation. Lord, can you help me do that? God says, I will be faithful to a thousand generations. And you are one of them. Just one. God keeping his promise to you is not a difficult thing. I know it feels like a heavy matter in our lives. Like, Lord, can you lift this? You're trying to bench press, you know, like, you know, your, your two plates, you know, your 225, you know, just like, can I get this? 
The Lord's like, I bench press millions of pounds on the daily basis. This is nothing for me. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Noah waited in the dark ark by himself with his family and these animals and asked daily to the Lord. Maybe his kids, his son, walking up, hey, Dad, the waters are going to go down, right? Maybe one of his sons, maybe it was Ham, because he's funny, right? It's like a doubting Thomas or something every day, like, Dad, are you sure? Like, it sure doesn't look like it's going down. <laughs> right? The culture in the land had crept into the ark, maybe. Because the land, the people, it's never going to rain. God's not going to do that. Is that actually going to happen? And now in the ark, even the animals are looking at him weird, like, are you sure you got this? The cows, right? Like, uh, I only see a little bit more food, Noah. All the pressure on him. You ever feel that pressure in life? I do. Especially here in L.A. You know, we pray that our problems would go away. You know, instead of praying that your problems would go away, you should pray that God would give you a bigger back, that God would help you to sustain through the fire. You want to know why? Your testimony in the fire is brighter than no darkness at all. And so God will plunge his disciples into darkness so that we can burn bright. We can, we can really grab on to him. And it's not easy. But he will take the waters away. He always does. I love this verse. This verse ministered to me in a different way through this sermon. And I've quoted it hundreds of times. But this changed everything. Listen, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That when we wait upon God, we actually renew our strength. Point number two, if you're taking notes, the key to renewing your strength, are you ready? You want to get buff spiritually? You want that pomp, you know, Arnold? The key to renewing strength is waiting on the Lord. What? I thought waiting on the Lord was actually a deficiency. No, waiting on God actually renews our strength. You will mount up with wings like eagles after you're done waiting. You'll be so strong after you've gone through that thing because God has stretched you. He has grown you. Not stressing, we think. Not rushing, not pushing, not producing. Just waiting on him renews your strength. L.A. says, you want to renew your strength? Get in the gym. Get pumped. Go start 10 more businesses. Go be successful, man, and that'll renew your strength. You know what God says? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will be the strongest in the land, those who wait upon God. The only way you're going to be able to carry those tasks that you're pursuing, those successes that you want in this life, is if you are waiting upon the Lord. We love to think the key to strength, again, is working out. God says, no, the key to strength is waiting, learning to wait on me. Oh, Lord, teach us to wait. On the 150th day, the Lord began to send wind on the earth, to lower the waters. Did the Lord like just blow with his mouth? He's like, you know, and just, it just starts going away. I love these little texts though that we, we miss, we miss the graphics in it. Like what are the camera angles, right? What's really happening in the story? The Lord's like kicking back in his lazy boy recliner in heaven. The angels are serving him hors d'oeuvres. And the Lord says, is it 150 days guys? And you're like, yeah. Okay, uh, time for waters to start receding. And the Lord, what? Goes and picks up and starts throwing planets around, you know, like with his giant muscles. No, he just breathes. He just breathes one time and everything just starts moving. The easiest thing in the world for him, but he says, I have a plan and I'm going to do it at this time for my reason and for my plan because I'm teaching Noah something. 
The Lord began to move on the waters without telling Noah. Newsflash. You know that God can begin moving in your life and he doesn't have to tell you what he's doing? How long is it going to take? God could be moving in your life right now. You don't even know it. The waters are receding in your life right now. You don't even know it. Here we are worrying and wondering, when are the waters going to recede? And the Lord's already got a plan to recede them. Noah's stressing out at day 147, 148, 149. And on day 150, it starts to recede. He's like, oh, why was I, why did I spend all that energy stressing about it when the Lord told me he was going to do something? I think about Joseph, sold into slavery as a boy by his brothers. And how long did he wait in prison? Bible students, do you remember? So long. I heard like three different answers and like you confuse me now. I thought it was 20 years. Serge, 13. He was in there for decades. So say that, all right? Sneaky little preaching tool there. You see that? 13, thank you, thank you. Thank you. He sat in prison for a long time. But you think... Joseph sat there when he's sitting in prison. Do you think he ever wondered and said these words, Lord, why did you let my brother sell me into prison? Why didn't I get to grow up with my dad who loved me, who made that coat for me, handmade? You really love me. You really cherish me. Why don't I get to grow up with them and my family? Instead, I get to grow up in prison. And what does God say to him? Nothing. He doesn't say a word until one day a vision comes to him, able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And in one day, he goes from a prisoner 13 years to king of Egypt in one day. Everything changed in one day. Remember, the guys he interpreted the dreams for and helped out, they forgot about him. And then all of a sudden, one day, they just remember. God says today is the day, and he is now king of Egypt, has more power than Pharaoh. And God says, I was working a plan. I didn't speak. I didn't say anything. I was doing something, and you didn't know it. I wasn't just making you king of Egypt. I was doing it because there's a famine coming, and I'm going to give you the wisdom to save millions of people from starving to death. And you will be my savior. You will be a picture of the savior to come. Be the bread of life. Jesus the king. Joseph had to wait. Job had to wait. He lost his family, his job, his home, his money. He didn't know what God was doing. Remember, he complains for like 30-something chapters in the book of Job to his friends. What is God doing? What is God doing? And then God reveals what he's doing and restored everything, healing, making everything right. John Blankard put it this way. Listen to this quote. Waiting for an answer to prayer is often part of the answer. Waiting is part of the answer to your prayers. As soon as God answers, we stop praying. Interesting. So would he allow the situation to continue just so we spend more time with him? Teaching us. Look at verse 4. The ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So another four months have passed. And on the 224th day, the tops of the mountains could be seen. They open up a window, and they see the top of a mountain. It's working. Mount Ararat. This is in Turkey. We're going to show some pictures here. It's actually a place on the earth. The mountain ranges of Ararat in Turkey. Here is Ararat. And I've got four pictures there. It's understandable that with human imagination, when it runs wild, coming to Mount Ararat, because it's so majestic. Elevation, 16,854 feet, visible from four different countries, resides in Turkey. And Answers in Genesis says this about it, such good stuff. The biblical reference to mountains of Ararat, right here in our text that we're looking at right now, as the landing site of the ark suggests those mountains formed well before the flood ended. 
And so uh, the final picture here, this is the mountain ranges of Ararat. That the ark could be could have settled anywhere in there, but um, very quickly because we don't have a ton of time, um, I'm going to say this. Uh, there's basically three layers that have have covered this territory, or there are three layers total, two that have covered the territory. A lot of people think, oh, Noah's Ark, we're going to find it on the earth. And you see all these expeditions and all this stuff. Uh, you're not going to find it. And here's why. I'll give you a couple different reasons. Number one, uh, this layer that you see right now is, is the top layer that has come from uh, volcanic activity. Those two mountaintops there are two uh, volcanoes. And so they have poured out, but under that layer that you see right there is another entire volcanic layer, like 600 feet of volcanic thickness that, that buries the place where the ark actually would have landed and been. And so we've got two layers on top of where the ark might have been. And then the bigger question is, is how could this stuff even have survived these thousands of years under all of that? And people, you know, a couple of the reasons is number one, they needed wood as soon as they got off the ark to start building. And so maybe they tore down the ark and started using it to build their city, right? Number two, uh, decay over time. I mean, you, you put a barn out in the elements, um, and even if you put lacquer on it, Thompson's water seal, not a commercial or anything like that. Uh, you know, you're trying to seal it. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. It worked. Uh, you try to seal it over time. Even 200 years of continual seal is going to tear down the material on the inside. Just 200 years, it's not going to work. Finally, people say, oh, no, it was locked in the ice. Well, the problems with the glaciers is that they melt and they move and they constantly back and forth. Thousands of years of that is going to rip this thing to shred. So we're probably never going to find the ark, but who cares? What does that even matter if we find a big box of wood? Because we have proof that there was a worldwide flood already on the earth. If you dig down into those layers, you find fossils from the ocean. Sea creatures, how did that get there from a worldwide flood? And if you, if you listen to the stories of the different cultures, we know, as we studied earlier, there are 270 stories from cultures around the world that date back thousands of years, all proclaiming that there was a worldwide flood. Why do we hide this from our textbooks? It's reported history. So we will not find the ark, but little... Uh, geography lesson there on Mount Ararat. And you can still go visit it today, yes. Get on a plane, go to Turkey, Istanbul, and uh, you can find your way over there. It's beautiful. I've never been, but it'd be fun to go see it. Back to our story. Water's slowly going down, so much that the ark could finally touch the top of the mountains. The only problem is Noah couldn't open the ark and go outside because the land was not dry. It would have been a mud disaster, right? It's like the mudslides. But the animals would have nowhere to go. So he had to wait patiently for the ground to dry. Amazing. They continue to be stuck in that ark. You ever been in a situation where you can force something if you want to, but you know if you force it and it's not the Lord, it might get dirty and muddy? Noah could have done that. And as soon as they touched the mountain, he could have opened the door of the ark and let the animals out, and many could have just drowned right on the spot. The animals need plants to eat. They would have starved. There are all kinds of bad things that could have happened, and Noah waited on the Lord even through all these details. Imagine being so anxious, like, just let's get off this boat. Have you ever done that, though? You know you should have waited on the Lord, but you jumped the gun anyway made mistakes and it costs you greatly. It's better to listen to the Lord and be patient, obey his commands, wait on him, than to jump the gun. I'll never forget this one because I it, well, it happened to me. Um, I can't remember. It's probably like 10 years ago or whatever, but I had, I had found basically this uh, Land Rover Range Rover for around like 10 grand or whatever. It was a 98. And I went and bought this thing again for like 10 grand. It was the biggest mistake of my entire life. I think I had like 80,000 miles on it or something like that. I didn't, know the guy, I didn't know much about cars back then, but the guy who sold it to me was working me over. That car cost me almost double or triple what I paid for it. The motor blew up, all this stuff. The suspension would go out constantly. I'd be, we'd be working on it nonstop. It was the biggest mistake of my life, and I almost felt like when I was 
getting ready to dive into it, I'm like, man, maybe I shouldn't do this one. Now, I'm not throwing Land Rover or Range Rover under the bus. If you have one, praise God. You know, it's great. Don't buy a super used one like me, 150,000 miles. Don't do that. Uh, but um, it was a mistake. And that's a very practical mistake in my life. It was a, it was a specific thing uh, for, for a vehicle of all things. But we're not talking about vehicles here. We're talking about spiritual things more than anything. Remember Abraham and Sarah? They were getting very old. And they hadn't had a son. He's like 90 years old. He's like, Lord, you said you were going to give me a son. And that the nation was going to come through this boy. Where is he? And Sarah comes up with the beautiful idea of Abraham sleeping with her handmaid. Husband, uh, Abe, uh, can we talk about some stuff? You know, um, I know it's been 90 years and stuff, and I just don't know if this is actually going to happen. I know the Lord told us it was going to, but uh, I just don't know if it's going to happen. So what do you think about sleeping with Hagar? Abraham's like, oh, that's terrible. Okay. <laughs> uh, tonight, tomorrow, uh, five times this week, what do you want to do? Hey, you want me to sleep with Hagar? Okay, let's do it. And they did. Remember, they had Ishmael. And the Bible tells us that that mistake plagued the nation. It cost them greatly because they, they pushed forward. They, they, they moved forward without seeking the Lord. They made something happen without listening to God. John Calvin put it this way, there is no place for faith if we expect God to fulfill immediately what he promises. There's no place for faith if we expect God to do it now. But if we say, Lord, I got to wait on you, what does that take? Faith. And then what happens during that time of waiting? My faith grows, and I'm able to trust him for more in the future. Amen? Waiting takes faith. And we know it's impossible to please God without faith. Waiting is exactly where he wants us at times. Waiting produces faith, which pleases God. Look at verses 6 and 7. It tightens up here at the end. So it came to pass at the end of the 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. So 40 days later, another month of waiting. It's been eight months. Noah sends out a raven. Now what's the significance of a raven? This is Noah's first attempt to see if the ground was dry enough for an animal to live, and he sends out a raven first. Why? It is because it is least of value in the animal kingdom. It is not a bird that you can eat. It's not a bird that you can sacrifice. It's unclean before the Lord. It's kind of like a scavenger, and it eats whatever. So that's why he picked a raven. People like to stretch that one, but really that's basically it. So this first attempt, the raven leaves, never comes back. Wondering how long Noah waited. He had to wait a long time. When's that bird coming back? Hey, raven! He goes outside calling to the raven. Hey, dodo bird, get back over here. You know, like, what is taking so long? And it never comes. Look at verse, we already read 8 to 12, but he ends up waiting longer. The raven doesn't return. Noah sends out a dove, second, to see if there is dry land. And the dove goes out the first time, and what? Not a dodo bird comes back. The dove comes back. So Noah, he knows that there is no dry ground for the bird to live on because it came back, so he waits another seven days, then he sends the dove out again. But this time the dove brings back an olive branch from an olive tree. I don't know exactly what this means, but I thought it was interesting the dove didn't just stay in the tree. Right? Finds an olive branch and just sits there. Like, oh, I found an olive branch. Okay, I don't need to fly all the way back to the ark. But I would say this, maybe this was a gift of hope. The first bird he let out, the raven never came back. The second attempt with the dove, the dove came back with nothing. The third attempt, it comes back with a branch from a tree. It's a sign of hope. This lets us know that there is some hope of dry ground and trees, a place where the birds and animals can rest and eat. I believe God is in control of everything, yes, even the birds. And I believe that the Lord had that dove bring the branch back to Noah to give him more hope. God letting Noah know, I've got this. Trust me. 
I'm in control. The water will leave. I will keep my promise. You will walk on dry ground again. God is a way of letting us know everything's going to be all right. You ever get those? You kind of get to the end of your rope, and you're like, Lord, I don't have any rope, and he gives you a little more. It gives you something to hold on to. We need this in our lives. A lot, most of the time, it is the Word of God anchoring us and holding us in the storms of life. Point three, if you're taking notes, God will bring olive branches of hope in our lives. The third time Noah let the dove go, it left and didn't come back, and Noah then knew, or the final time, that the bird had found a home. Maybe this message, this sermon that you are hearing is kind of like an olive branch to you. A message of hope, a reminder, the dove is coming and bringing the branch to you, letting you know, hey, this is God, what are the chances that God is speaking to you right now in this time of your life, at this season, and God is speaking directly in this text to us. I want to encourage you, everything's going to work out in his perfect will and perfect timing, to trust the Lord. I know that's cliche, but we need to be reminded, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. It will fail you. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. 279 days at this point when the bird left and didn't come back. It's been a little over nine months that Noah had been on the ark waiting. Look at verse 13 and 14. Came to pass in the 600th and first uh, year. In the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. Noah moved the covering of the ark and looked. Indeed, the surface of the ground was dry, and in the second month of the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. 375 days, the ground was finally dry. Just as the Lord had promised, it wasn't in Noah's timing, it was God's timing, but he kept his promise like he always does. Look at verse 15, 16, 17. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of flesh that is with you. Bring birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. The Lord now, after a full year, stop there, speaks to Noah. It's been a year, silence, and gives him more instruction to leave the ark, get all the animals off the ark, and then be fruitful and multiply. Look at verse 18 to 20, our final text. Noah went out, his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. Verse 20, my fave. Are you ready? Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Praise God. God saved Noah. God kept his promise to Noah. And so the first thing that Noah would do when he gets off the boat is get in and out Burger. No? Because that's what you do when you get back to L.A., huh? You run to in and out I know, me too. No. He would say, I'm going to Disneyland. No, that's not what he would do either. He says, I'm going to build an altar to the Lord and what? Worship. This is amazing. Point number four and in closing, when the Lord opens the door, don't forget to worship. Don't forget. Precious people, family of God, Sons and daughters of the Most High, has the Lord not promised to you that he will prevail? When he prevails, do not run down out of the ark and just start playing and having a good time and doing your thing. Stop and bless God and worship and thank him for what he has done in your life. Do not forget to worship. Psalm 9-1, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. God was still number one in Noah's heart. Noah knew that it was the Lord that saved him, not himself. Noah spent over a hundred years building the ark himself, but he did not save himself. It was the Lord. God is the hero of the story, not Noah. God promised to save Noah and did simply because he believed God at his word. Let me ask you, do you believe God at his word? He has said specific things to you. Do you believe him 
at his gospel, his saving message. Psalm 62, 8, here it is. Trust in him, the Lord, at all times, O oh, you people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. Amen. As we close in prayer, I just want to call out to you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what burdens you're carrying, but it is time for us to call on the Lord and say, Lord, I've come to wait on you. And maybe for those of you who are just checking out the church, checking out Christianity, I want to encourage you that God is a Savior who comes to save us from our sin, the sinful lifestyles that destroy us, and to bring us into close relationship with Him. God is calling you into deeper relationship. He's calling you to turn away from worshiping all those other gods in the city that just end up destroying and tearing your life down, but to turn to Him with all of your heart, make Jesus Lord and Savior over your life. So I'm going to pray two things as we close. Number one, for those who need to make moves in the direction of God, who need to have sin forgiven, who need to be saved from judgment before God, sin forgiven so they can go to heaven when they die. Number two, for those of you carrying burdens, you're waiting on the Lord and he's sending you an olive branch. He's going to prevail. He always does. Amen.